Hi, I'm Micah Hirschman here at Book Expo America in New York City with Jonathan Lethem, author of Chronic City. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. I want to dive right in. I'm so excited about Chronic City and I want right. to ask you a question that's been burning in my mind. Uh -huh. Kirkus Tooth. What inspired him? <laughs> Where did you come up with that brilliant, evocative name? Yeah. And, and, and what's he all about? Well, uh, Perkis is a kind of, well, you know, let me start with the name. He's actually, in a way, the protagonist of my first unpublished novel. I had a character named Perkis Tooth in a book that I began when I was 18 years old. <laughs> it took me three years to write it, and by the time I was done, I was a much better writer than I'd begun uh, being, and the book was hopeless. And I knew it and shelved it, and it, it will never see the light of day. But in some way, Perkis stayed in my mind as a, as a name and sort of as a character. Um, <laughs> Now, 25 years later, basically, um, the Perkis tooth I've invented and put in Chronic City is a kind of combination of uh, every cranky friend I ever fell in love with, everyone I ever knew who had some sort of, you know, bizarre conspiracy theory or paranoid philosophy of the entire universe, who I wanted to both, you know, uh, slap some sense into and couldn't get enough of hanging out with them because they were so charismatic and so funny and so strange. And, uh, you know, and that includes actually a number of, of uh, friends who were academics and rock critics and, you know, all sorts of thinkers and writers and, and provocateurs uh, are sort of folded into this one character. And needless to say, there's a bit of myself in him as well. I, I can never seem to write a character um, who's a, uh, well, who's as prominent and important to the book and in so many scenes without using parts of my own, if not life story, parts of my own personality to build him. Is there anything particularly relevant or meaningful in the name Perkis Tooth? You know, <clears throat> it's not something I could explain. I, <laughs> I like names that suggest that they have some sort of um, symbolic or allegorical importance if only you could figure it out and unpack it but you never can they just stand there charged with mis mysterious potentiality that they never completely discharge that's that's my favorite kind of name and Perkis Tooth is one of the best perfect. I've come up with I am curious early in your novel Chronic City you introduce a concept amnesiac uh -huh. you've also edited the vintage book of amnesia right I'm curious is, the, is it a concept you like? Can you talk about Amnesiac and, and, yeah. and why? Well, I like, I like Amnesia stories a lot. And in a way, my first two novels, each of my first two novels, Gun with Occasional Music and Amnesia Moon, are basically stories about memory loss. And shortly after that, I conceived of this anthology, which I edited, the vintage book of Amnesia. And I think, for me, it's some sort of default position for a, for a character in fiction to be in. That actually has a strong resemblance to this to the reader situation you begin page one you know entering a world that you don't know anything about and you're about to begin identifying with a character and living in a world but you need every piece of information offered to you because you you don't have any equipment for thinking about it um, and I've always wanted to write uh, another amnesia story and although chronic city doesn't really declare itself to be one in many ways it is the, the situation that chase in Stedman, the narrator is in, he's, he's not aware of being an amnesiac. He's, he's in a kind of double disadvantage in that way. Um, so I guess it was me who amnesiac him. You have written across a lot of genres. You've touched on them and drawn them into your novels. Yeah. Um, as a genre reader, a fan, a fan of yours, I, I would love to hear you talk for a minute about, about how you see genre in fiction, how it influences you. I do think that in some ways I see genre slightly differently than than um, many other people do. I think a lot of people follow the cues of the bookstores and libraries that they enter into. And they think, well, there's sort of crime or mystery, and there's science fiction, and then maybe there's romance or Western, and then there's normal writing. And to me, <laughs> first of all, I think there are many, many more genres than those bookstore categories suggest. I think that smuggled in, for instance, within the mystery shelves, or whatever it's going to be called, are, you know, uh, the, the British tradition of the kind of um, imperial, charismatic, 
slightly eccentric detective who wanders into a sort of zone of innocence where someone has committed a hor horrendous crime and and identifies the guilty party and takes them away and then everything's okay again. And I think there's the American hard-boiled detective tradition which is almost the opposite in a way. The whole world is corrupt and only the detective is uh, capable of identifying who among all these horrible corrupt people might be worth saving or protecting. Um, you know, it's a very dark kind of dystopian worldview. And then there's a third kind of book that also hides inside the, the mystery section that isn't uh, a detective story and doesn't necessarily have a solution and clues, but it's the crime novel, you know, where the, mm -hmm. the criminal's the protagonist and the world is told from his point of view and you're not wondering who did it. In fact, you're, you're with him from the very beginning. So for me, I see genre everywhere I look and it excites me. These, these narrative archetypes, I guess you'd call them, or, or you know, um, belief sets, uh, I, whenever I see one, I tend to want to find a way to fool around with it and have something to do with it. It is obvious in your writing that you are interested in and in love with pop culture. Yeah. I, I would love to hear your perspective on pop culture today, how you consume it today, yeah. and, and really how is that different than the pop culture you consumed or how you consumed pop culture when you were a kid? It so clearly right. made a difference in, in your writing. Well, <clears throat> I mean, the first thing I should say is my credentials actually in terms of contemporary pop culture are very thin. I, <laughs> I barely ever know what is a hit song. And when I hear the names of musicians that are genuinely on the top 40 now, I usually completely unrecognizable to me. I watched two or three television shows and that's very, very few by the standards of most, most people I know who have any interest in television at all. And I don't even keep up with um, comic books anymore. What I am is mostly in a very intense relationship to the pop culture that formed my experience when I was coming of age. And I'm still digesting and thinking about the implications of things that, you know, stirred me up when I had no context for this stuff. You know, like Gilligan's Island. What was Gilligan's Island? I'm still trying to contend with it at some level of my being. And the music that, that I learned to love when I first listened to Top 40 radio, you know, and, uh, and then the next development when I, you know, got cool and turned to FM instead of AM and started listening to WNEW and then lo and behold there's college radio and it was infinitely more interesting and, you know, so, but these formative discoveries in some way I'm still stuck in time. I'm not really like some sort of uh, great expert on, on the present moment. And, and, you know, another really important part of pop culture now is websites and YouTube and I'm I'm a real dilettante. I mean, there's stuff that I've seen that thrills me, but I have no comprehensive sense of it, the way some people do. Great. Well, thanks, Jonathan, for joining us. You bet. Congratulations on your new novel, Chronic City. Thanks.